Okay. I think we pretty much have the right quorum for now. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome uh, to Project Vocals, this program, the truth behind our cultural heritage in building climate resiliency. Um, this program is held in conjunction with the Harvest Festivals of Kamatan and Kauai, which falls on 30th May and 1st June, respectively. I'm Yasmin Rashid, uh, founder and president of Econites, and I shall be your host and moderator for this program. So I hope everyone's ready to be blown away by our young speakers. And before we do that, I'll just perhaps like to share with you that this program is powered by the Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program, or GFSGP, of the United Nations Development Program. And we at Econites are currently leading this effort with all the amazing young and inspiring young people out there. A couple of housekeeping rules. Um, this session will be recorded and published on our website. Uh, good stuff you have to share with a lot of people. And we'll also be using it uh, in social media. Um, if you do not want to be featured for any reasons, uh, you, have, you can kindly turn off your camera if you don't want to appear on it. Um, I hope everyone is on mute. Uh, hopefully you can do this at all times so that we won't uh, interrupt the ongoing discussion. Um, all the questions that you want to ask um, will be done during the Q&A session, and that can be done by sending uh, your questions into the chat box uh, to your right, bottom right, and uh, we will address that later. Um, there will be a quick photography session uh, before the program ends. Uh, not every day we get to have a picture with the speakers. We really wish this was a physical program and we can do it in reality, but I guess the digital image is better than none. So during that time, we hope that you would join us and participate and turn on your camera. And for all of you that took your time off uh, to join us today, you will receive an electronic certificate, uh, which will be emailed to you. So let's go on to um, um, introducing uh, the first, few speak uh, first speaker of the day. Um, his name is Kendi Mito. I had the honor and privilege to know Kendi many, many years ago. I can't remember how long exactly, but uh, I think the universe brought us together at the Kuala Lumpur Eco Film Festival. Um, he's an artist of the indigenous Bidayo people of Sarawak, and he's currently senior lecturer in the Creative Industries Department at Chao UC, uh, which stands for Tunku Abdul Rahman University College. Can you receive his Bachelor of Fine Art honorary degree in 2009? a Master's of Art and Design, Art History and Culture Management in 2012, and his Doctor of Philosophy in Art and Design in 2020 at UITM Selangor, Malaysia. Dr. Kendi Mito, I should have started that way. His research and artworks and writings uh, reflect uh, mainly the Bidayo traditional culture and tradition, especially on ritual ceremonies, beliefs, myths, symbols that are related with traditional arts, crafts, and um, offering. I had an opportunity during one of Cleft to enjoy his exhibition. Um, it, is, it was very intense and powerful for me, Kendi. His artworks experimentation uh, uh, is with different mediums. Um, as a visual arts practitioner and educator, and he hopes to pass down such knowledge and values to communicate narrative storytelling in hopes of bringing communities together and keeping these traditions alive. So without much further ado, I'll uh, present to you Dr. Kendi Mito. Over to you, Kendi. Hello, hello everyone. I think um, maybe I can start my presentation. Can you see my slide? Can I? Okay. Basically, what I'm trying to share to you is actually the, about the ritual ceremony. My topic today, I will share to you about the traditional ceremony and ritual with other people as a reflection of the spiritual culture. Basically, um, I'm trying to uh, share to you about the traditional ritual. And then how as a Budayu people uh, reflection in the, the daily life or the spiritual uh, ritual ceremony. Lah. Okay. 
basically the first uh, slide you can see that I using the my my own self portrait back to Bidayu roots because this one uh, is my uh, expression actually how I want to discover by my my roots lah. okay the next one this one I uh, the the moderator already uh, shared to you just just now about myself and then later you can follow my Instagram or my behind if you want to know more about my artworks and then basically uh, Bidayu culture before they start doing the ritual the shaman or daimori will do a uh, chanting or prayer to call the ancestor to call the spirit to bless the, the ceremony uh, same thing like what i'm doing today because i think before we start we need to do like prayer and then to uh, get the blessing from uh, from the spirit lah. okay and then the next one you can see that uh, generally without people uh, know as a land daya basically live in borneo actually is the fourth largest of the group ethnic in sarawak basically b mean people dayu mean land together we have like 29 dayu group in sarawak lah. we have like different different language 29 uh, group mean is different different area and then uh, basically you can see they have like from dulu from uh, Bau and then from Pernison, sometimes from, from the Syrian also. This is the Jagoi Bau, lah. this is the area that I live now. Lah. Okay. And then basically, according to the belief, uh, we came from the uh, Indonesia, actually, Gunung Sungkong, and then migrate to Sarawak uh, at or 9th century ago. Lah. And then basically, uh, the name of Bau, this one basically last time we called Triana, and then because the head of mountain, because the silhouette of the mountain, like the head, okay, like the head mountain. And then uh, when the Jansput came to this Bau, the uh, wrongly pronounced mount as a Bau. This one until now we call Bau, uh, Bau. Uh, around like 45 minutes from Kuching to uh, Bau Sarawak. Uh. Okay, this is the the Tasik Bidu. Basically, this last time the Tasik Bidu is actually the place where people uh, do a gold mine. Actually, this one a gold mine. After that, they put the water and then become a Tasik Bidu. We call Tasik Bidu. And then this is the Bau Town. Uh, Bau Town is where is my place. It's very beautiful. They got a lot of the mountain. Okay. Okay. Basically, uh, Bidayu believe all the person in the in the in the nature basically in the universe basically uh, everything in this world like human animal vegetable like mineral basically they have their own soul actually you need to respect each other because when you respect uh, respect the nature the the nature also will respect you this this the uh, indigenous people believe uh, and then they still believe in animism. And then basically some of the animals uh, or dream they believe that can guide them into the, in the daily life activity basically. And then shaman is very important in the Bidayu uh, ceremony because the, they have a link between the human and spiritual world. Uh. Okay. The next one, this is the, the view of my, my village actually, my kampung in the 20 and 20, 2021. Okay. Basically, uh, I like to explore about the nature. Also, I like to go to the cave, and then this is my parents' uh, kebun garden. And then, uh, the best thing about the MCO, not I say MCO is the best, but you can see that uh, the world is uh, how to, how to say uh, the the smakin pule. You can see that the first time that you can see the the sky is very bright, and then suddenly last time I think. Uh, when I stay small, when I wake up, you can see the kabos ah, waktu malam. Suddenly, eh, waktu siang lah, kabos waktu pagi. And then after, after that, no more uh, already. And then after a few years, because the MCO, the, I think the, the earth like, jadi pulih balik, actually. Okay, this is the, I like to explore the nature, the things. And then the next one, this is the thing that I, my artwork, basically this one, the spirit dilemma. What have you done? Basically, this is my reaction about the about the nature and then the human, because basically our indigenous people knowledge they from the oral tradition, and then they pass down to generation to generation, and then after that, um, sometime, what I trying to do is 
what human has done in the nature, they cut the tree, everything that this this why my title is uh, spirit world dilemma, la, dilemma. What have you done to the devil? La? Okay, I just go to the next one. This is the my world, my kampong, because basically I like to show my nature first, huh? and how I inspired by the artwork. And then basically the the this is the certain certain ritual that they do. La. The Gawai ceremony. Gawai itself, you can see they have five days to do the ritual uh, for the Gawai annual. Uh. And then after that, um, this is the thing that I do for my work about the tree of root related to the nature also. But we need to go back to our roots. Uh. And then basically, uh, this is the Gawai Daya. Basically, Gawai Daya, uh, we celebrate on the 1st June. Okay, 1st and 2nd June. This is the way how we do ceremony ritual. This is the, the basically the ritual that Vidayu always do. Different different ritual they have different different name like uh, Niga, Rasang, Niga, Niliga. They have different different name also in the Vidayu term lah. This one sometimes they do a healing ritual also. Okay, but today I will will share to you about this one uh, about my my paper last time in the Plate magazine, uh, edited by Tan Dime. Okay, basically, uh, what I want to show is Gawian Nigal Nilaga. This one in the ritual uh, river ritual uh, in the stream. Okay, and then you can see that uh, river is very important in the Bidayu people uh, because without water they cannot do this kind of ritual ceremony because community they believe that uh, using the water is a symbol of cleanness. Okay like pure pure okay and then they have like uh, supernatural power also lah during this ceremony and then this why uh, offering is important basically uh, when they do offering during the this ritual basically they want to give uh, say sorry actually because during the planting rust season they have like animals like insect killing a kill by the 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 burn the 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 hutan right and then this one they give the uh, offering to to say sorry lah actually this kind of thing and then basically this is the ritual that basically they do they put inside the water using the beads and then after that actually this kind of ritual they actually they calling the the fish to help them to find and return paddy seed that lost during the planting harvest return to the village actually this is the true story yeah? because when they do ritual you cannot see anything inside here but suddenly after that ritual automatically the, you can see the seed paddy here basically inside the water basically because the they believe that everything that you you terjato jangan membazir they mean is you cannot membazir they give the spirit give back to you okay And then uh, this one is the another meaning of the niga. Basically, they avoid wasting and lost paddy seed lah during the planting until harvesting process lah can be used again. Okay, actually like process like journey lah from the sky to the rain, and then rain to the land, land to the water, and then to the river, and then to the fish lah. Okay, the fish also symbolize a spiritual animal. Spiritual animal. Okay, the, after that, so you can see that how I using back my culture thing to, to transform into the artwork. Okay, all the, the, the ritual and then the using the chicken as a sacrifice, as an offering. And then what I want to discuss now, you can see this, is, this one is the title before it running out. Because you can see an example like in my, my kampong last time. Actually, if you see this one, all this one actually a stream last time, a river. But uh, last time I still remember when I still kid, I always uh, mandi sini dengan my auntie. But now you can see the dry already. Actually, the dry because because of the development, because they do the road. And after they do the road, the land side, tanah runtuh, and then the, all the tanah here. And then that's why the, the, the river, the mendap sikit actually. Okay. And then when the rainy season, th this one will be flooding also lah float also and then when dry season the water will be dry actually and then this one is the same thing you can see the, the river that i mentioned to do lah. less water already 
inside the ritual ceremony. This one 2016, and then this one is 2018. You can see the uh, almost dry when they do the ritual. And then this one also, the nature also dry, and then my culture also dry, because you can see less than 10% people still practice this kind of ancient beliefs. Now, I think like 2% or 3% practice this kind of ancient belief. Lah. At the same time, you can see that uh, the young generation now is more familiar with uh, other culture, and then some of them confuse between tradition and culture, actually. This is the latest one, lah, last, not two years ago, 2019. Some of them already convert to Christian, okay? And then this one is the, when I go do research with the, this one, lah, the dying body. And then this is the thing that reflection of my thing, lah, how I do about the inner conflicts, the Christianity and the mass. And then at the same time, re re uh, reflection, basically I, I always do the nature. I, I always ask, the student do the nature inside my class. And then I apply back why, what I'm research about indigenous people. And then I taught my student how you use this kind of traditional thing and apply into the contemporary art. Lah. Because my I told them you need to learn from the nature is the best thing if you want to learn art. This kind is the process. And then sometimes I do work with my student also. And then this one also some of the program I do about indigenous people. And then I with Shah for you also. Okay, sometimes I do project, most of my project also sometimes related with nature and the culture. Lah. Okay, thank you. Because already 10 minutes. Okay, I hope okay lah, this one. I, all right. Thank you so much, Candy. Uh, I have so many questions about your artwork, where, what inspires you. But I think we'll save it for the Q&A uh, question uh, later. And I hope you guys enjoy uh, Candy's session earlier on. Our next speaker has a beautiful name spelled in a very unique way, Senorita. A Kadazan Dusun born and raised, she's currently taking uh, her undergraduate degree in marine sciences at uh, UKM, University of Bangsa and Malaysia. She's a member of the Komohakan movement, which um, I, uh, in 2020, maybe you can share with us what this movement is all about later, Senorita. And she's also one of the ambassadors in the Malaysia Ocean Youth Ambassador 2021 program. She currently serves as the Vice President of the UKM Global Club of the International Relations Center in UKM, and she's very active in events and matters related to youth empowerment, conservation, sustainability, and Indigenous communities. So I present to you, Senorita. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And I want to wish you guys happy Kamatan and happy Gawai in advance. We'll be celebrating Kamatan very, very soon. Okay, so I will share my screen. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Hi again, Kopi Bosian. My name is Senorita Sining and I am from Ranao Sabah. I am one of the members for Komuhakan. And as you can see here, Komuhakan is actually directly translated to English as youth. So Komuhakan youth, uh, Komuhakan movement means youth movement. That's what we are made of, youth. Yeah, so. Our objective to um, this movement is that to promote and maintain the um, heritage, culture, and also identity of the indigenous communities across Sabah. And that is our logo up there. It is a symbol of Sigar and the symbol of the indigenous people and KM for Komohakan. We have six teams under Komohakan, design team, social media, translators, research and writing, photography, and community outreach. However, for now, um, the photography team and community outreach team are not really um, active because of this whole pandemic. But hopefully after this, we can be more active in going out for community outreach and so on. Yeah, oh, before that, um, for now we have um, 22 members. However, we are not focusing on each team. So basically we are working together as one and helping each other in each team. 
So what we do, we aspire to um, empower indigenous groups in state through education, like language, culture, and history, and also social entrepreneurship, like um, doing collaboration with the indigenous people to promote the work. For example, we have our members, Micah, with her music, and um, somebody doing arts, and we are promoting the works um, through Komohakan. At Komohakan, we believe that youths have a social responsibility and ability to lead and advocate in our local community. So these are a few of the successful activity that uh, and program that we um, have made throughout the year, because this is our uh, officially first year to be Komohakan. Um, we started Komohakan in May 2020, and now currently in May 2021, it is currently our first year together. So throughout the year, this is what we have done. The first one is Kadazan Yusun Short Story and Essay Competition 2020. Um, we collaborated with the Karazan Dusun Language Foundation, KLF, and there were around 40 participants from prim primary and secondary school. The cool thing about this is that this is the first ever um, Karazan short story in this competition have ever established or launched in uh, Malaysia, which is outside of the school. The second one is the collaboration with UKC or United Kingdom and Air Council. Um, we are doing the Malaysian language and culture classes and we took the About Sabah. So we um, do this in three weeks. Each week have, we have one class. We talk about the cultures of Sabah, the uh, Bahasa Melayu Sabah and the Karazan Dusun language and also the history and the contemporary of Sabah. We have more or less like 50 participants. They are all very active and they joined the whole three week session. And our participants came from West and East of Malaysia, some international students also from uh, United Kingdom, Philippines, and also Venezuela. Uh, this is also one of the organization that Komohakan collaborated with. And here in the Rajak project, Komohakan shared about the rich culture and the people that live in Sabah. Okay, Karazan word of the day. This is um, the feed that we post in our Instagram account every alternate day to keep the language, basically to keep the language alive and teach people not only the word itself, but also how to use it in sentence. And we provide also the way to pronounce it. Talking about climate related issues and Komohakan, um, because Komohakan is not an environmental NGO, we don't really necessarily focus on climate justice. Even though we don't work as um, specifically in this environmental issues, we do support those who do. So below I attach two um, organization based in Sabah that is working on this climate justice. The first one is Malaysian Ocean Youth Ambassador Moya. Uh, I am also one of the ambassador for this uh, organization. And Moya focused on um, giving a chance to young people to tell these stories through creative and uh, creative story, um, to creative platform and harness the leadership skills in themselves. And the, uh, the next one is Tony Boom. Tony Boom is a social enterprise based organization. It is dedicated towards development and promotion of the renewable energy and also appropriate technology based in um, Pinampang, Kampung Nampasan um, there. So what can we do as young people? Three simple things, but powerful things we can do is to support, follow, and share. So this is these are the simple, simplest thing we can do, but giving the big impact for us. Whenever we see the great alternatives or um, initiative that our friends are doing, please do share and support because it is giving such a big impact for us. And don't forget to follow us, Kumuhakan in Facebook, Instagram, and also in Twitter. And we uh, recently started on TikTok also. We do uh, appreciate if you can follow us. Thank you so much. And before I end my session, I think I would like to share a video by WWF Malaysia. And this video caught my attention. It is very um, interesting, amazing. 
it delivers an important message and um, beautiful message for us all. Thank you so much. Duduk Kanau Negeri Sabah 2018 Nomor 30 Mewakili Daerah Inanau Tati Hosyani Memenangi gelaran Unduk Ngadau tahun 2018 Sangat bermakna bagi saya ia lebih dari sekadar warisan penting bagi kadazan dusun di Sabah. Menjiwai semangat Huminodun yang diwakili untuk Madau, saya membayangkan pengorbanannya untuk menyelamatkan rakyatnya dari kebuluran. Menurut legenda, Huminodun yaitu satu-satunya putri kadazan Kinoingan yang disebut Hinokizan telah dikorbankan dagingnya untuk nasi kepalanya untuk kelapa tulangnya untuk ubi kayu dan jari kakinya untuk halia saya tertanya-tanya apakah sebenarnya maksud pengorbanan Huminodun bagi kita hari ini Pengorbanan Huminodun mengikat kita semua kepada alam semula jadi Hutan yang memberikan udara segar, air bersih, sumber makanan dan tempat minyak Selama bertahun-tahun, kita telah memanfaatkan bumi untuk kepentingan manusia Untuk pembangunan dan juga kemakmuran Sekiranya Huminodun ada di antara kita hari ini Saya tertanya-tanya, apa yang akan dicapai? Iti no pengatana walai om tonggungon tokau Sabagi dot sakag di Uminodun, tokau na pengawi nga mongingongli om manamong di Tiwinon. Moi dot ketilombus lumaag mantad dot anak di ti, mikuod poin lapai kasan. Mositi tokau no tumimpun manamong koin sanai di ti dot ososono. Kanau no potimpunun tokau di ti da maseti. Videos. Is it available online, Senorita? Yes, the video is available on YouTube. Okay, great. Um, we'll drop a link later uh, over there because I think I think everyone deserves to watch it again and again. Thank you so much, Senorita, for the presentation. Um, we're on to the third and final speaker before uh, we have fun with them in the Q and A session. I've known this speaker when she was this little, um, many, many years ago. I can't remember how long ago. Um, Ron is a community facilitator who wears many hats. And trust me, I've seen all, all of her in all these hats. She became the founder of Project We at the tender age of 19. Project We is a community development initiative that advocates for the sustainability of rural communities through entrepreneurial development and community tourism initiatives. Some of these activities include elements of community service and cross-cultural exchange, which attracts participation from people of all walks of life uh, and all over the country as well. She's also a co-producer of My Beat Drum Circles in Malaysia, a certified drum circle facilitator trainer for Southeast Asia, a certified professional coach, and also a dinosaur enthusiast. She currently lives in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And to all the participants, I present to you, Ron. Hello, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm just going to quickly share my slides here. Okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Ron, 
And I am, as Yasmin said, the founder of Project We. Um, and I wear many hats. We is my biggest hat. And uh, excuse me if I may sound terrible today because I got my COVID jab yesterday. So I'm all over the place today. I'll do my best, I promise. Okay, so who are we? We is youth led. And what we do is we advocate for the sustainability of rural communities in Malaysia. Mainly, we work in Sarawak. I myself am not Sarawakian, I acknowledge that. Um, though I have been working in Sarawak for the past eight years and I love it there. Or if not, I wouldn't be there for eight years. Uh, we get all the Malaysian and foreign youth to do the groundwork for us. So we make it a volunteering project and we make sure that the volunteering projects benefit both the community that we work with and also the volunteers. So how we align ourselves with SDGs, we align ourselves with 3, 12 and 13. And some of the activities that we do for that include organic farming promotion. Uh, Barrio is the main village that we work in in Sarawak and Barrio is known for the Barrio rice. And so we try to promote um, traditional farming methods and also uh, not using pesticides and chemicals in their farming to maintain um, the, the, the quality of Barrio rice. We do a lot of community tourism development, and that's our main thing that we do now in Barrio. We have done some policy alignment as well, uh, but we worked with other organizations to do this. We don't align the policies, but we do the data collection and send it over to the NGOs so that they can make those uh, policy recommendations. And also we do climate change education, uh, raising awareness of illegal logging that's very prominent in Sarawak and also uh, waste management in the kampong. So the problem that we face now in Malaysia and in places all over the world, oh wait, they get to that later. These are some of the pictures that we have uh, of the activities you do. The people that we work with in Barrio are called Kalabits. So at the top are some of the ladies that we work with, their smiling faces. And this is one of the groups of volunteers we had. And there's me. Um, we also do uh, a lot of groundwork, physical field work, uh, in the Sawapadi. So this one here is a lady and we have one of our volunteers on the right. So he could be uh, collecting data on her or uh, learning about what barrio rice is like, et cetera, et cetera. And on the left, we have also a lot of cultural exchange that goes on, uh, learning how to dance, speak their language. Um, and at the bottom is uh, some of the community tours that we run. So on the right is the tour guide and he's um, talking to the tourists from the Project We group about his Kalulut bees and how he harvests the honey. So again, uh, like I said, the problem that we're facing now in Malaysia and all over the world is things like this that we see. Uh, Orang Asli, the indigenous people, Sabah, Sarawak, everywhere are losing their land at an enormous rate. And these three headlines alone came from the last two weeks weeks and we already have these things and these are the reported cases you know the unreported cases could be many many more in the last two weeks but we just don't know that and this is a serious problem as we all know and how that affects cultural heritage so um excuse the dinosaurs they're supposed to be people but the people didn't look good in the clip art so i use dinosaurs so imagine this the people the dinosaurs lose their land and that affects climate change. Global temperatures rise. The more global temperatures rise, the more they will lose their land. And what they become is called climate refugees. Climate refugees are people that lose their land, their homes, their cultural sites because of uh, what is happening with the, the climate change. And of course, this creates an ecosystem imbalance and that trickles down not only to affect uh, the natives, but it also affects us that live in the cities because, as we know, uh, our rainforests are carbon sinks. And if we don't protect those carbon sinks, we're all just going to get hotter and hotter and not in, the, in not in the good way hot. And of course, soil erosion also contributes and climate change. So this is what the current situation is like. You know, the people who are making the decisions on what uh, land to use for uh, oil palm or what land to use for uh, logging is being made by people who are not of native culture. People who are sitting somewhere in 
you know, a big building, I shall not mention where, and making these decisions. And what needs to happen instead is natives have to make the decision on what they want to do with their land. And what this is called is participation. Participation is not consultation. A lot of times when we go into communities, we consult, oh, uh, so can we take away this land? And then we give cash incentives. And that's not enough. That is not enough to guarantee that they are saying yes, because they do not have the necessary information that was given to them. Like you can see in the previous slide, they don't know what is going on and they're being lied to. And so they need to decide, you know, what they want to do with their land because this can prevent things like uh, further development that may be bad for the environment. And of course, participation is voluntary. That means you don't force them to make a decision and it is a human right. So we know that Indigenous people are at the forefront of climate resilience. And they're the ones protecting our forests. They're the people that we need to protect. And these are some of the um, headlines that show why. But what you can do as youth, Inyarita already said this as well, so I'm gonna say a bit more. What this is called is everyday activism. Pinpoint the issues that matter the most to you and ask yourself, why does this matter to me? And then learn about them. If you can, uh, talk to your friends, join forums like this and, you know, volunteer. But the thing with volunteering is once you finish the volunteering, it doesn't stop there. You have to continue on with activism. And we are all activists. We cannot say, no, 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 I'm not an activist. Think of things like, you know, the Palestine-Israel conflict. Everyone was sharing, you know, articles here and there. Yes, we have to do this. We have to do this and fight for the rights. Why don't we do that same thing with issues that are close to home, like here? If we can share those for what's happening overseas, we need to be able to share that for what's happening here too. Share, speak up about injustices that you see because it makes a change. And if you are a native, practice your cultural heritage because we don't want to lose this. And we may say, oh, we need to do things on a big scale. I know some people have seen this slide before. Uh, we need to do things on a big scale. If not, it's insignificant and nothing's gonna change. But imagine that we all do a little bit. That can also become big scale if we all take the time to share and learn about these things. So here's an example of change. Now, in 15 seconds, I want you guys to guess what was wrong with this picture. 15 seconds. Kendi, you should know this. You're Sarawakian. Okay. Now, this was a Gawai ad from a big company here. And someone said, hey, you Salala. And if you didn't guess what it was, the hornbill was wrong. So not everyone sees that, right? That was the great hornbill. And the Sarawak state bird is the rhinoceros hornbill. See the difference? Great hornbill, rhinoceros hornbill. So when somebody speaks up like that, it makes a change. Somebody will, you know, now these people in this big company know, oops, we made a mistake, bad PR, but now we know. And now we know for those of you that couldn't pick it out, right? So these are the small things that we can do to make that change. Every small change is significant and you have to believe that, especially as a youth. So uh, here are my details if you want, just Project V, everything, W-H-E-E, very easy to remember. And thank you so much. It's good to be back with Equal Nights again. Thank you, Ron. So, now that we have three speakers done with their presentation, we'd like to encourage you to drop some questions on the chat box here on your right. And before we get to answering uh, the questions that you're asking, we're going to take a little short break with a couple of minutes of entertainment. And what I'm going to share with you is done by a very good friend of mine, Elena Moran. She's a born and born Dayak European living in KL who sings in the native languages of Kalamit and Kenya. 
So let's um, have a look at her latest, I think it was just newly launched music video, and let's listen to the message. Hi everyone, I'm Elena Morang, and my latest music video, Warrior Spirit, is based off a traditional tune, um, and the tune was for the warrior dance. And we interpreted the song as kind of the, the meditation of the warrior on the morning of battle. And even though we don't practice warfare and we don't have battles anymore, and we haven't done for about two generations, I still see that we carry that spirit within us. We still have the spirit of the warrior within us. You know, um, we're very courageous and brave and, and we continue to fight together uh, for something that's greater than ourselves. And that's something that I want to acknowledge that, you know, we've inherited this, this grit and we've inherited these values. And I want to apply that to Project Vocal as well because the environment is something that I'm very close to and our people as well in Sarawak are very close to our land and very close to the, the natural environment and it's only if we stand together and it's only if we kind of stand up and speak out and fight for you know what's right and what's right is to care for Mother Earth, is to care for the environment and it's to acknowledge that we are part of nature, we are nature and you know, we need to fight for its safety and fighting for its safety is fighting for our safety as well. So yeah, I hope that we can all kind of bring out that warrior spirit in us because I think that's what we all need to continue living together safely and to continue um, living together. And my hope for all of us is that we bring out the warrior spirit within us to stand up, to speak out and to take action for the environment. Because as I always say, to love Mother Earth is to love each other and is to love ourselves as well. So here's to the warrior in you and let's keep fighting for a better place together. Don't forget to check out my music video, Warrior Spirit, on my YouTube page. And it's a single from my latest album, Sky Songs, which is on all digital platforms. Tiga tawai, terima kasih, and don't stop fighting for the greater good. So there you go. Um, a message from uh, Project Vocals Ambassador. Do check her Instagram as well as her YouTube channel. She's got tons of other music videos that are uh, greatly inspired by nature and uh, communities. So welcome back. We're going to jump straight into the panel discussion. This is where we grill the speakers a little bit. So you can be gentle with some of the questions, but hey, climate uh, change, climate action is is something very, very pertinent today. And I think within whatever communities you're in, it's important to tackle the topic of culture as well as building community resiliency. So I'll start first with um, a question, um, maybe for Senorita or even Candy. Uh, and the question goes, in, in your observations, um, how, how does cultural heritage affect building a community's resilience. Um, if you can share some stories to show how value and connections for communities to land in nature and environment actually are important. Um, like for, to Senorita, for example, um, if you can share the implementation of the Tagal system in river care by the Karasan Dusun, that would be great. Um, like for Candy, maybe a little bit about your ritual revival. I think what we I want you to share with our audience is um, how cultural heritage actually uh, is one of the di key dimensions in building climate resiliency. Any of you would like to start first? Okay, so this is such an interesting question. I uh, actually, at first, I want to show this thing in my slide, but I would not have enough time to explain about that. Um, as we know, indigenous people, they are active in making handcrafts, such as mat. They are making mat using the hands. But then now, um, not everyone is um, feeling uh, like, they are okay to go to the forest and uh, look for all the materials to make 
make the map. And a lot of people in my place, they are Karazan people, and they are old people. They are make, making bags and made mat and um, um, casing using a reused plastic packaging from foods. So like um, the packaging for coffee, packaging for biscuits, they're making use of that old thing to make something useful for them to use every day. And the most beautiful thing I have seen, my auntie, um, she wore a bag made of um, food packaging of her kids, <laughs> her kids' snacks, and she collect all of the uh, all of the packagings and she made it. And some of them, um, they even sell it, and people are interested to buy. And I think this is one of the interesting thing how cultural can make people do something about the climate resilience. That's it. Thanks, Senorita. What about you, Candy? I think um, my uh, just my uh, in um, my opinion, I think basically if you I talk about the philosophy things because you can see that just now when I present thing, you can see that indigenous people they live harmony with the nature. Actually, as a modern community, actually we need to learn from the philosophy of the indigenous people. They they respect the nature. When you respect the nature, the nature will respect you back because uh, that's that that is the thing. Because last time I still remember when I go to Sabah, when I uh, follow my friend uh, Amanda, we go to the Terian because Terian is the place that the, the, the government will do the dam. Okay. And after that, uh, when I interview one a person, they say to, to, to us, why government want to take this kind of the land? Why they want to uh, send them to the, uh, to the city? Because they say the, the place that they live is the, the Pesti Sejok, the Pesti Icebox they orang. Dia cakap, bila dia nak makan, dia ambil. Bila dia, dia nak makan itu, dia pergi. Dia tak membazir dia makan bila dia, dia go find the food when they need. They not greedy to take the, the things. I think this the, this is the kind of thing that we can learn from the from the indigenous people. Because at the end of the day, when you respect the nature, when you take the thing that you need only, actually automatically you contribute to the climax also. Not necessarily you want, uh, what I mean is, the the what the Snorita mentioned just now. Sometimes this kind of the philosophy also can be part of the example as the indigenous people. This is my opinion. Lah. You see, I answer your question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Candy. Yeah. I I I like to share my perspective as well. Uh, I I I I experience great values at home. Um, opposite. Uh, I, I grew up with my grandmother who were, is from mainland China and is basically uh, a survivor of the Second World War. And because of the state of how the war left communities with not enough to eat, not enough resources, if you're not resilient, you can't survive. And she brought those values uh, back to raising us. So when people ask me, why do you do sustainability? For me, it makes sense because I grew up in an environment where um, for her, it makes sense not to waste. But dulu dulu, you cannot afford to waste. Um, simple things like you have to tanam, you have to know your seeds because if you don't tanam, there's no food. Uh, and because she was forced into that situation, these values came out from her. And for me, it was just, it made sense. I mean, it made it made perfect sense to what we call sustainability now. It makes perfect sense to what you call climate action now. So I, I urge actually many of our audience here to perhaps pay a bit more attention to cultural heritage. While we are infused with digital technology, all sorts of change, mange, IR 4.0 stuff, I think sometimes the fundamental aspects of building resiliency towards climate action is embedded in our culture, in our practices, in our heydays. Contohnya, when I was about your age, kalau pergi pasar malam, tak pernah pun tapau air. Kalau nak beli air, the guy would just have the bag jual air dengan cups. You stand there and drink. If you cannot finish, you just leave it there. There is no such thing as plastic container or plastic straws. That's how it was in Pasar Malam for me. 
So um, I think we have some questions. Um, uh, do I read it out, uh, Knights? Uh, yeah. So I think we have a question from, uh, I assume it's No Akila, the Balea, and I'm a Akila No. Um, hi, thanks for joining us. Her question is maybe to any of the speakers uh, in respect of time, maybe you'll get one of the speakers to answer a question. The question is, how is the youth participation like in raising the cultural awareness and inheriting the customs from older generations? Maybe Senorita or Candy, I think Candy, you showed some images and that makin kurang eh, uh, of your community following traditions. So what, what is the, yeah, why youth participation is low and... Mm, actually, this is based on my experience and then based on the community that I when actually the best thing when I do research I like to talk with the community itself especially young people uh, some of them inspire what I do especially as an artist and I do about the culture heritage and then they ask me how how can I be like you and then but uh, at the same time they'll be afraid because of the parents because sometimes when you converted to Christian already because some of the, the thing they don't understand about the confused about culture and then religion, they say when you question, you cannot touch this kind of thing. But I say, I told them, what you can do is just do whatever that you can. Doesn't matter your documentation, you do writing, you take picture. Maybe in the future, people will be looking for you. At the same time, when you need my help, I can help you how to uh, writing, everything, documentation. That, 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 that's the thing that I can help them with in terms of the how to... Uh, not not to say to preserve how to documentation the 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 all the ritual to can be used for the in the future lah. This is the thing how we can do lah for me my my opinion lah. Because at the same time they got getting all also very hard also we, when we do interview lah to get gather the the information actually. Yeah, thanks, Candy. I think Senoritas organization uh, Kamuna Hakan is doing great. Maybe you can share a little bit. Um, I'm going to follow you at IG because I think I can learn a word a day from you and be in tune with your culture. Perhaps to answer Nobakila's question, uh, perspective from you, Senorita. Yes. Okay, so in Kamuna Hakan that I shared just now, we have a few teams and there are research teams and also writing and translator teams. And these teams, they are very doing a very great job because last time they um, met, met with the Kadazan Dusun Language Foundation. And for some uh, point, they are successfully got the chance to see the archive of the Kadazan Dusun from a very long time ago. It is such an honor for us to read the archive ourselves. And our translation team and also our uh, research team, we made a lot of um, articles about this. So we do a lot of research and we share with others of um, our culture. And for your information, you can um, read our articles in um, Medium website. Thanks, Senorita. We've got a very interesting question from Fatin Hamza. Um, her question goes, the narrative of environmental protection has always been focused on scientific knowledge. Um, and we see that in the media as well, though sometimes I do question the scientific uh, validation of some of the news. But how do you think that for Indigenous knowledge, how do you think Indigenous knowledge can be formalized and be included in part of a bigger environmental management plan? I think this question is more on Indigenous um, knowledge, culture, tradition in improving the environment. Do you think we're doing that? Do you think we're incorporating indigenous knowledge and environmental management? Absolutely not. That's um, very different. And, and I think what needs to happen is, like I said, participation. Um, and it's a very radical kind of idea to include indigenous knowledge into something like policy. And it's probably not something that a lot of people or a lot of countries have even thought about because you know the way our system is and the way we've been operating is all based on science and listening to what's above. But you know, increasingly we're realizing that um, going back to our roots and going back 
to our cultural heritage and you know nature uh, makes more of a difference than just the scientific journals so you know it's maybe not something that we can change per se yet but it's something that you can talk about and I'm going to emphasize talking about it because you know if we don't start with ourselves and if we don't say that's wrong you know what you should be doing this then we're not going to change perhaps you um, Fatin could be the one to go into this field and in incorporate indigenous knowledge into our policies <laughs> so if you don't see it happening maybe it has to start with you um any comments from candy or senorita all right well i've got a question um the pandemic recently has been a real wake up call uh, from nature um, or the climate or just bad human actions. As a leader on the front lines of your advocacy work, Candy and Senorita, could you share how youth coming from indigenous communities play a crit critical role in this and um, how to get them fully engaged in cons conservation and sustainability initiatives? Yeah, so despite of um, this whole pandemic things, despite of limiting uh, many physical events, the pandemic has actually paved the way for digital advocacy. Um, and we are doing this with people where people are not being able to meet each other physically, only having a choice to limit that um, awareness campaign and that's it. But it is important to utilize the digital platforms that we have now like Zoom, Google Meet, and so on. So how can we um, making, um, how can we spark the interest in maintaining, practicing this cultural heritage and also promoting this um, climate resilience is by, um, we know young people, they often become more enthusiastic and confident when their views are taken seriously and, and acted upon. Therefore, youth are more keen to involve in public engagement and events when they are given the chance to voice out the opinion and not just by being receiving um, in the receiving end. Yeah, I, I think I think this is the right time for many of, of the young aspiring leaders that have joined this call. Many of you um, grew up with technology, digital technology at the tip of your fingertips compared to traditional paths of advocacy, you probably rely on newspapers, Selling, uh, sending mailers, you know, actually using stems to get support and actually physical petitions. And now with just digital platforms overnight, you can get thousands and thousands of um, advocates you know, to support your efforts. So, which technically should actually encourage more of you uh, to be inspired and empowered to lead the way in driving some of your passions. Um, I think we probably have one or two more questions. Um, any, we just want to check with the knights if there's anything coming from the audience. Yes, we have one from Ashraf Raslan. Um, and his question is, to effectively implement climate resilience locally, we need indigenous people's active participation, knowledge and wisdom. Yet their participation hasn't been known or even vocal. Why is that? And why do you foresee there will be more of a mix of indigenous people in the cabinet? So I'll, I guess I'll direct this to any of the speakers, but I, I don't like to offer my opinion, uh, if you don't mind. I think sometimes you don't see things when you don't search for it as well. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes I realize if I don't search for it, uh, how ignorant I am as well. And I was exposed to Jaringan or Angasas Mananjong probably about 12 years ago. Um, and lo and behold, you know, it's, it's a network of uh, peninsula indigenous community organizations. Turns out there are NGOs by indigenous communities. Yet, 
we say that there's not enough representation. So maybe Senorita Kendi, what need, what else needs to be done to get it out there? Um, my opinion is I think um, like when I when I friend with Sahakoyo and then Alina Murang and then my friend Khaled also actually we we aware about this one but actually as a news people we try our best to uh, to let community see us what we do at the end of the day um, I think the person that people that interested in in this this kind of issue they will support and then we'll see what whatever that we do actually if like you ask about the cabinet that one is like this one is very complicated for me i think it's this why my co comment on it what do you think Senorita and ro ro, ro what huh <laughs> i cannot i cannot pronounce your name proper, correctly <laughs> Okay, so I think indigenous people, they have the idea, they have um, the knowledge of what they are trying to say to the higher authorities about this, um, especially about this climate resilience. But um, often they are not having the right channel or having the knowledge of how to carry it out. So that is why it is important to have representative of each indigenous community who are working actively in advocacy um, to communi communicate with all levels of community and gaining public support. That is why th this is one of the things that we are lacking. We are lacking in gaining public support. That's why people are not seeing us through the lens. Or maybe we can do some like social entrepreneurship. We are working with well-known people like, do you know Orang Putih Kita? Yeah, so last time, I knew about Moya, uh, the Malaysian Ocean Youth Ambassador from Orang Putih Kita Instagram account. There is why I know, oh, my people is doing this thing for my uh, environment. Why not? I want to join like that. So it is important to have social entrepreneurship among us. What about you, I mean? I'm going to go on the uh, more controversial side and say that we don't have enough people like Kendi and Senorita in the indigenous communities like who are willing to represent and who are willing to get out and do the groundwork. And I know this might come from a place of ignorance or, you know, but I've been in Sarawak for eight years. And if you have been to Sabah or Sarawak, you will realize that it's a very relaxed place. And once you go there, sometimes you don't feel like doing anything. And there's a lot of talk among the indigenous people that I know that say, biasalah, what to do. And it's this kind of, you know, relax and don't care attitude that doesn't get people anywhere. And when people try to speak, it shut down. And I, I can understand how, you know, being in your situation, you know, sometimes there could be backlash from the elders in your community and all of that. And it, it's, it's tough, but we need to understand that there's not just like, it's not the fault of let's say the policy makers per se, but it's also the, the fault that participation is not part of the culture of um, some indigenous communities. I know it's very controversial, but I, I just need to say that. Need to, we need people like the two of you to really pull the community up. And once you can make that change, then you can make a change in your kampongs and Sabah and Sarawak as well. People like us, the outsiders, we can only do so much before it's up to you. I have a question for Candy. Is religion a threat to your culture? Uh, can you repeat this one? Is religion a threat? To continuation of your culture? Yes, actually, yes, it's true. Can you share more? Uh, actually, one, okay, this is the thing that if you saw my work just now, the mask one and then the cross at the eyes, the stump, actually, the, the why I inner conflict this one, actually, one of the dying body shaman, I interviewed them. Actually, the they become Christian because the, the daughter forced her to become a Christian. 
because they say this uh this kind of ritual no more people practice and then because they're getting old already and then when i interview her they she crying actually because they say they, they need to be forced to become christian this one my work is using the mask you inside your your heart you still be you you still practice this kind of culture but you you wear mask as a christianity this is the, the the thing that i try to put inside my work because um sometimes it's very difficult also because, uh, uh, when you do this kind of thing but uh, so yeah. Mm. yeah and i think that's something that is i don't think it's too sensitive i think for for many of our participants who are in an urban setting i think we're used to that narrative and uh, the use of religion uh, to undermine uh, other race or culture but i think it, it is quite a threat in 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 the aspects of Sabah and Sarawak, because culture is such a critical essence of your community. Um, I heard that during the pandemic, um, there were some NGOs that were trying to help uh, indigenous communities in Perak, um, but as they entered some of these communities, they actually ended up running deep into deeper areas of the forest, not because they don't want help. Uh, for the pandemic, but they were being fearful of being converted. Um, and, and then that's quite sad that religion and culture cannot coexist uh, in, in this kind of uh, setting. Something to think about. I don't think I have an answer to that. Um, ha any more questions uh, from our um, esteemed audience? Uh, that are in here, or maybe just a bit of a sharing session. Uh, actually, Candy, I'd like to know a little bit more of the inspiration of that artwork behind you. Oh, if you okay. can share with the audience. Okay, the inspiration, basically what I'm done is I'm, I, I believe that whatever that you do, you need to have an experience first. Because I think when you read, it's important also. But when you, after we read, we need to go to the site. And then when you go to the site, you need to mix with the community. When you mix the, with the community, you, you, need, uh, you can see the true story. And then based on that one, especially the ritual, I try to transfer what I experienced, what they're feeling into my artwork. But I using in terms of the contemporary material. But at the same time, I try to mix with traditional material like the bamboo, like the uh, all about the nature. Because I, feel, I think that when people go to the, the gallery last time when I do exhibition in Petronas Gallery, they say uh, my work is close to them because uh, they're related with nature. I think everybody, when you go to the thing, go to the jungle, everything, you feel like very close and very peaceful. That's why I try to put inside my work everything that related to the Gawai with the Yula, especially. At the same time, I do also about the um another not related with the Vidayu, but uh, related with underworld, spiritual world. Actually, just to share to you, uh, actually, this few months when I stay in the kampong, actually, I helping my auntie. Actually, my auntie is like, she got a gift that uh, the spirit can enter her body and then helping people to cure, cure the illness. Uh. Because sometimes, uh, the the kejutraan, whatever that you you inside your body people cannot cure but when you go to this kind of spiritual they will help you but the spirit that help uh in go enter to my auntie one is the christian uh, christian and then actually based on that time I, I i like to ask her about the the uh, what happened when we die what happened and then sometimes sometimes the uh about the spiritual uh, Actually, a lot of the things that I discovered, but I think at the end of the day, because that's my passion, I like to do this kind of things, I like to do research, I like to do this world, spiritual thing. That's the, and then hopefully I can present that kind of thing in the future about the traditional healing. Thanks for that, Candy. We've got, we're going to take a final question from uh, Aram Banuki Joshi. Um, many aspects of culture are difficult to learn in books and museums. So how do we, how do we start preserving culture, cultural heritage, you know, so that in the long term we could practice traditional ways to tackle climate change? Dinarita, Ron. 
Yes. Um. So, for my opinion, the thing in museum and books they are limited. Not everything is there, so you have to go out and venture. Not really like going out and meet people for now, but there are a lot of videos in YouTube. There are a lot of articles in Google that you can read, and maybe um, we can check what are they doing for environment. And I would like to share our um, traditional, um, what we have practiced traditionally from long time ago, that is actually uh, one of the best way of preserving our um, climate. For example, Karazan Dusun people, they have linopot. Linopot is rice that is wrapped using leaf. So we can see that indigenous people, they are not using plastic, containers or even polystyrene containers to sell their foods. They're using whatever they have in the surrounding and they are preserving our environment. So I think this is simply what the indigenous do to save our environment. And if you want to do the same, you can start today. You can start every, every, whenever that you want. It's just like, if you have the will, then you can do it. Thanks for that, Senorita. Actually, I agree with Norita. Actually, when I in the kampung also, I can still see the grandmother, nenene, when they go to pasar, they put all the, the thing like they buy, like chicken, whatever, the sayur, whatever, they put in the basket, tambo. In Bidai, we call tambo. I think it's the good way because, but very less young people want to do this kind of thing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, if, if, if you go to the city, some people that practice, they see this kind of uh, orang kampung do this kind of style, they become like trend actually. Because you can see now, you, you go to airport, suddenly people using tambo, right? I think <laughs> the one is good also. But some yeah. people feel like weird, but I think very interesting actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I wear a pinnacle, uh, that's the only thing I wear anyway when I go to work. Um, it does strike a lot of conversations. And, and what I do with my pinnacle is I customize it with a few of the uh, makers. So I have more contemporary colors, like black silver, black gold, so that I, I can try to infuse a bit of cultural awareness by making it a bit more trendy. So that's all the questions we have uh, today. Um, thank you very much to all the participants that have joined us. I believe a recorded version of this will be available. I'd like to end with a story um, for most of you. When I was a 22-year-old young university graduate, I had the opportunity, I was working with WWF and I was a freshwater scientist back then. And my job was to collect water samples from all the major tributaries of Sungai Selangor. Back then, we didn't have Selangor Dam. And our job was to look at documenting the areas that will be inundated by the flood when the dam comes up. And many of these areas like Bretak village and all that are indigenous communities village. So there was one time I was at a river collecting water and it was eight in the morning and I saw a group of indigenous communities. I forgot the, the name of the tribe, but they are nomadic. Um, and I saw them many, many times in months to come uh, as well. So one day they had a barbecue by the river. And we parked our car, my job was to collect water. And as soon as I parked the car, I realized there were little fingers near um, my, my vehicle. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what they're barbecuing. So I went over there and they were barbecuing uh, monyet, lah, like monyet golek, like, like ayah kambing golek. And um, the monyet was intact, the fur was intact. And um, they, uh, they've they seen our faces before, so they ajak lah join us in the barbecue. Of course, we were like, we don't want to be disrespectful. We'll join you in a barbecue. And uh, so we felt that maybe we should ask them some questions. And I went, um, why are you barbecuing? I, my first question is, why are you barbecuing the monkey without like, like gutting it? You know, all the organs are gone. In this case, it was a whole intact monkey. And one of the elders told me, Orang di bandar ada garam, ada sauce, ada all sorts of things. Kami di sini tiada. So one way of cooking it this way is to retain the moisture and juiciness of the meat. Uh, this is all from the juices of the meat. And I'm like, yeah, that's, a, that's actually logical uh, to maintain that sweetness. 
And um, and then we ask them, kenapa makan monyet? Kenapa tak makan ayam? And then they started laughing at me. And they would say, ayam kotor. Makan di darat. Makan cacing. Monyet atas pokok. Makan daun. Makan buah. Monyet lagi bersih. And that's when I just had like, oh my God, you know, that logic I never thought of. And you go about, you know, excessive farming, chicken, you know, it, it's all these issues, antibiotics and all that. I'm like, that's really like good, good, great organic meat there from the forest, right? And the final question. You've got all the barang with you. You've got that stick to barbecue that monkey. But of all things, you only chop off the digits of the monkey, but not the monkey. Why? And then they all laughed again. Monyet guna jari garusini garusana kotor. Jadi, we take out the dirty parts and we eat the clean parts. And I'm like, totally logical as well. And from that perspective, I felt that whatever narrative I have in my mind as our orang banda really needs to take a seat back. And I thought I had, I gained so much wisdom just understanding that it was the cultural heritage of them that keep them healthy, that make the forest their yeah, supermat, and that keeps them very in tune with good ways of taking care of their body, mind, and soul. So with that story, some food for thought, I thank you very much. We were only expecting about 30 over participants, but we have a whopping 42 of you here today. So I hope many of you will go out there and share more about Project Mogul's effort. Do participate in our advocacy work for climate action, but more importantly, do follow the works of Ron, Senorita and Candy, and do stop them on social media. With that, thank you very much from SGPGEF and UNDP as well as Econites. Have a great weekend.